Hello everyone, welcome to the English Danny channel and Happy New Year! And today we are going to be talking about the New Year and about, in America at least, uh, what we'd like to do <clears throat> after the New Year, which is set something called New Year's Resolutions. What exactly are New Year's Resolutions and how can we talk about them in English? Well, New Year's resolutions are essentially plans that you make uh, that improve your life over the next year. In America, we like to uh, set things, set a plan in our life that will uh, improve our health or some other thing in our life that maybe this year wasn't so good and that we want to change. Um, some popular choices are, I think definitely the number one is go to the gym, exercise more often, um, eat healthier, improve your diet is also very popular, um, learning about something, maybe a language like English, or a skill if you want to learn a, a musical instrument that's very popular, um, spending more time with your family, uh, maybe getting a pet or volunteer work. These are all very popular things uh, to set your resolution for. So, how can we talk about our resolutions in day-to-day -day speech? If you want to talk about this with your friend, um, if you ask them what their plan is for the next year, you're going to be talking about the future. So, you have to be using future tenses and there are four future tenses in English, but we really only use two of them to talk about making plans. And then there's a third way to talk about the future as well, which we'll, we'll talk about later in the video. So the first way and the easiest way to talk about the future or to talk about your plans is to use simple future tense. And this is very easy, it's just, I will. The word will is a marker to show in a sentence that you are going to talk about the future. And we can use it to talk about our plans or even to predict the future. In the case of resolutions, you are predicting your own future and also showing your own willingness and your want to do something. Some examples of this in use, very easy, just I will go to the gym. I will eat less junk food. These are both very, very popular New Year's resolutions and are very easy to say. The other tense that we can use when we talk about the future and ourselves is the present continuous tense. And this is, in, in a phrase, will be, I will be, verb, ing, the present tense uh, form of, of the verb. This is used to project ourselves into the future and to imagine what we might be doing at a specific time. So some examples of this, I will be exercising every day in 2020. Or, I will be visiting my family every month this year. The third way that we can talk about the future, and especially New Year's resolutions, um, and this is also a more informal and natural way to talk uh, to your friends in a conversation, is to use the word going instead of will. So you can use the word going uh, to talk about your plans, um, and this has three parts. The first part is the to be verb conjugated to match the subject. So if he is the subject, you would say he is or she is. I am. They are. So you have to conjugate the verb to be and then paired, pair it with going. So you can say, I am going, and the third part is the infinitive form of the main verb. So you can say, 
I am going to practice speaking English this year. This shows that you are talking about the future and you are making a plan and a commitment to improve your English and practice this year. Another, uh, another example of this with a different uh, subject and, and verb conjugation is they are going to graduate school this year. So you can see that I changed the verb as well and at the same time the, the verb conjugation to be changed because the subject is they. The use of going to talk about the future is mainly used to talk about plans or intentions and sometimes even to make predictions about the future. So its usage is very similar to just simple uh, future tense. I will or I am going to are often used in the same way. Okay, students, that's our lesson on New Year's resolutions and I hope you had a very happy new year. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button below and also turn on notifications for our, for our videos. Also, be sure to hit the like button. Thanks for tuning in to the English Danny channel. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the English Danny channel. I'm Teacher John, and I'm here to help you become great at learning English. In today's lesson, we will be talking about minimal pairs. This is a lesson that is aimed to help you improve your speaking and also maybe help you improve your listening. First, let's talk about what exactly is a minimal pair. A minimal pair is a pair of words or two words that only have one different sound. This different sound can be a consonant, such as B or P, like the B or P sound, or it can be a vowel, such as the A and E sound, or A and E. Some simple examples are sat and set, leaf and leave, or think and sink. Why are minimal pairs helpful for you as an English student? Well, again, they can help you improve your speaking very much for sounds that often are difficult for ESL students, but also they can help you improve your listening. When you listen to a native speaker or someone speaking English, it can become easier and easier to hear a word that is similar to another word, but only has one different sound. There are many of them. So, let's take a look at some of the sounds that are difficult for ESL students and also some exercises that will help you improve your speaking and your listening. Let's take a look at the short I, long E, and short E sounds. Many students often struggle with hearing the difference between these sounds. They are a little bit similar, but really they are quite different and they often are used in words that are very different from each other so it's important to be able to say these sounds correctly and also be able to hear the difference. So let's do an activity that you can do by yourself at home but also with your friends or other students so you can practice and help speak and listen to these different sounds. Now I will say a word and I want you to choose the correct answer. This word is sit. What did you choose? Did you choose sit, seat, or set? The answer is sit, S-I-T. I is the short I sound, and it is a little bit difficult to hear the difference between the long E sound, which is E and the short E sound, which is E. It's actually a very good idea just to practice saying these sounds and also listening to the differences. So again, let's listen to these three words and so you can hear the difference in each sound. Sit, seat, set. The three different vowel sounds in these words are 
I, E, and E. Now, let's try the same activity with the same words, but this time I will cover my mouth with a book. This is important because you really need to be able to hear the difference between each of these sounds. Okay, I'm going to say the words and you should choose the correct answer. The word is seat. Did you choose sit, seat, or set? The correct answer is seat. S-E-A-T. It's a long E sound. Seat. You can repeat this activity with other students or your friends to improve your speaking and your listening. Now, let's talk about two other sounds that students also have a difficult time with. These two sounds are S and TH, the voiced TH sound. They sound like S and Now, I will read a sentence to you, and after the sentence, please pause the video and try to write down the sentence correctly. Here's the sentence. The doctor sought to help all sick people and thought he really could. Okay, good job. Now let's take a look at the correct answer right here. You can see the two words that sound very similar but have very different meanings. If you switch the words, the sentence does not make sense. So it's very important to be able to say the two different sounds, S and TH, but also hear it. Now let's talk about two more sounds that students often have a difficult time with. These two sounds are L and R. The sounds are L and R. They're very different but also a little bit similar because some languages don't have a different sound for these two sounds, just one sound. Now, I will read a sentence to you and I want you again to pause the video after I say it and I want you to try and say the sentence. It's okay at first if you have to say the sentence very slowly, that's normal, but over time, if you practice, you should be able to say the sentence faster and faster, even in just five minutes of practicing. Here's the sentence. Remember to pause the video and practice afterwards. The alive squirrel arrived with wreathed leaves. One more time, I will say the sentence very slowly so you can hear it. The alive squirrel arrived with wreathed leaves. This is called a tongue twister. It is a very difficult sentence to say, but if you can practice this over time, your pronunciation will improve. Okay, students, that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed the lesson. Don't forget to share and like this video. And if you haven't subscribed, please press the red subscribe button below. Thanks for tuning in to the English Danny channel. Hello, students, and welcome back to the English Danny channel. I'm Teacher John, and I'm here to help you become great at using English. Today's lesson is going to be about improving your English by learning how most, mostly, and almost are different. Please consider subscribing by pressing the red subscribe button below. Also, be sure to like and share this video. Okay, students, let's get started. English students can often get confused by these three words, most, mostly, and almost. I definitely understand how this can be confusing. These words look very similar and sometimes their meanings can be only slightly different. Today, we'll look at the main differences between these words and also really look at how to use them correctly. Also, stick around until the end of the video to learn how to use almost correctly. So, let's talk about the word most. Most is the superlative form of the word much, 
and is used to form superlative adjectives and adverbs. It is used with the word the. For example, rock music is the most interesting to me, meaning rock music is my favorite. That was the most delicious food of my life, meaning this is the best food. This means that whatever noun comes after the word most is your favorite or something that you think is the best. You're comparing the noun to other things. When there is no comparison, you don't need to use the word the. For example, most rock music is interesting to me, meaning you like about 90% of rock music. Most food is delicious to me, meaning you like about 90% of food. In formal speech, most can be used the same as the word very. For example, that movie was most unusual, meaning very unusual. Or, you are most kind, meaning very kind. Most is also used with long adjectives or adjectives with three or more syllables. For example, it is the beautifulest painting in the room. Wrong. It is the most beautiful painting in the room. Correct. The word beautiful has three syllables, beautiful. So, we must use most before it when making a superlative statement. We can also use most before a noun phrase as a determiner. Usually, we do not use the word of unless there is another determiner or pronoun such as a, the, or my. For example, most of apples taste sweet. Wrong. Most apples taste sweet. Correct. Most the apples taste sweet. Wrong. Most of the apples taste sweet. Correct. Most my apples taste sweet. Wrong. Most of my apples taste sweet. Correct. Now let's talk about the word mostly. Mostly is an adverb that means mainly, most often, or in most cases. Let's look at some examples of how to use this word. The weather here is mostly sunny, but sometimes it rains. So, maybe the weather is 90% sunny or 10% rainy. School is mostly fun, but sometimes it can be difficult. So, maybe school is 85% fun, 15% difficult. Now, let's talk about the word almost. Almost is an adverb and it can be difficult to use correctly. It has a very similar meaning to the word nearly. You can use almost when talking about progress. For example, I am almost finished with my homework. Measurement, for example, I am almost 185 centimeters tall. Counting, for example, there are almost 30 people in this room. Saying something is similar to something else. For example, cats are almost like tigers, but smaller. 
negative or non-assertive words such as never or ever, nobody, anybody, or nothing, anything. For example, I almost never watch TV. I can eat almost anything. Okay, students, that's our lesson for today. Please check in the description below for more English learning videos. Also, consider liking, subscribing, and sharing this video. Thanks for tuning in to the English Danny channel. Hello, students. Welcome back to the English Danny channel. I'm Teacher John, and I'm here to help you become great at learning English. Today's lesson is going to be about how to talk faster in English. A lot of students really struggle with <clears throat> speaking quickly in English, and I'm speaking pretty naturally right now, so even if this could improve your listening skills as well once you learn how exactly native speakers speak so quickly. Today we'll discuss three things that will help you improve your speaking speed and you will be able to talk faster. The first thing that we're going to talk about today is using contractions. I know that this seems like a very simple hint or tip, but a lot of my students in particular know that they should contract the word or shorten the word, but they still say the two separate words. Um, so for example, a lot of my students will always say cannot instead of can't or did not instead of didn't. And I know that it's a very simple tip, but if you can really practice on memorizing all of the English tra uh, contractions, um, some of the longer ones like haven't or mustn't or shouldn't, wouldn't, couldn't, will really help you save time when you are speaking rather than saying would not, especially because sometimes the pronunciation of would or could uh, might be a little bit difficult for you in your native language. So, for example, just to show you how uh, a sentence can be shortened by the use of a few contractions, I'm sorry, but I cannot go to school today because my mother would not drive me. You can shorten this sentence a little bit by saying, I'm sorry, but I can't go to school today because my mother wouldn't drive me. The difference between these two sentences is subtle, so it's a very small difference, but if you can use contractions more and more often, your speaking will be faster because of it. The second hint or tip that we're going to talk about today is reducing verbs. There are actually many uh, verbs that you can reduce in English, and re by reduce I mean make smaller and faster, but we're just going to talk about four verbs that are very common in spoken English. The first one is going to. You can reduce it to gonna. Want to, which you can reduce to wanna. Have got to can be reduced to gotta, and have to can be reduced to have to. You can see that the ending vowel in the word to has been reduced to an a uh sound, which provides for a very smooth and fast transition to the next word. For example, I'm going to go to school today. If we reduce the verb, we would say, I'm gonna go to school today. I think it's easy to hear the difference between I'm going to go and I'm gonna go. You can see that it's faster. The third hint or tip that we're going to talk about today is reducing the word you. There are a lot of 
question words in English, especially who, what, where, when, and why, but also would and could are also question words in English. Um, so <clears throat> if we take a sentence, for example, like, what are you doing? And reduce what are you, we can say, what you're doing. This is very fast, it's very smooth as well. And this is the way that native speakers talk to each other. The word where can also have a, the subsequent word you reduced. So, where are you going can be reduced to where you're going. A third example is the word would. <clears throat> if you ask, would you please help me, can be reduced to, would you please help me? Here are some more examples of when the word you can be reduced with question words. What do you or what did you reduce to, watcha? How did you or how do you? How'd you? When do you? When did you? When you? Don't you? Don't you? Let me? Let me? I've got to? I've gotta? Do you want to? Wanna? Did you? Did ya? Okay, students, that's our lesson for today. If you liked this video, please hit the like button below. Also, don't forget to hit the red subscribe button. Thanks for tuning in to the English Danny channel.